My name is Talal Tabba. I'm the co-founder and COO of uh, the Jibril Network. Jibril Network is a Swiss-based uh, software development company focused on putting traditional financial assets on the Ethereum blockchain. I used to work at PricewaterhouseCoopers before uh, co-founding Jibril. I started Jibril Network to, as, as a remittance service, so using, ca uh, using cryptocurrencies as a form of remittance. But we realized that cryptocurrencies are too volatile for them to be used as only for remittance solutions. But they have transaction properties that are, that are very good. So what we did is we basically created asset-backed tokens. So that's cash-backed tokens, commodity-backed tokens, uh, whereby you have a traditional financial assets that's uh, regulated, insured, and uh, reasonably uh, stable in price, not, not as volatile as crypto. But at the same time, it has the transaction properties of cryptocurrencies where it's decentralized, 24-7, doesn't depend on humans. So by doing that, we were able to um, give traditional assets the transaction properties of crypto. Uh, the name Jibril actually is Arabic or Aramaic uh, for Gabriel, God's messenger, who's the connector of the heavens and the earth. Jibril wants to connect the crypto economy with the traditional economy because that's the only way for it to, to, to grow forward. Uh, some of the work that we've been doing, so I, I think I moved on past the bio, uh, but I guess it's, it's a natural progression. Uh, so most of the work that we've been doing has been with regulators, which is why we're very happy to be here in India, uh, especially at this conference where it's supported by Telangana and Goa government. Uh, it's, it's critical that not only the incumbents are the ones trying to come up with the innovation, it's the incumbents, startups, and the regulators all working on the same page, let's say. Uh, we've been lucky enough to work with the Central Bank of Jordan, Dubai Financial Services Authority, and uh, the Central Bank of Switzerland, FINMA. Um, as in Switzerland, we're a licensed financial intermediary, and in Jordan and Dubai, we're working as part of the Sandbox Initiatives, which I really suggest, um, let's say, the Central Bank of India and other government entities uh, try to take on a similar model. It's been very successful in Singapore, it's been very successful in, in several other countries where you allow these startups to come in and, and basically work in an unstructured environment, but with close controls. So I, I personally salute that India hasn't taken a very clear stand on crypto, because if there would be regulations today, they'd, they'd either be too loose and everything would, would, wouldn't turn out the way we want them to, or they'd, they'd be too strict and they'd stifle innovation. Um, so that, that approach of, of waiting to see how the technology progresses and then regulating it in the, in the right way is probably the best way to do it. It's always interesting to see uh, a new country, like a country just starting to, to adopt or to embrace blockchain technology. Uh, India has been the tech hub for the, or like the tech kitchen for the whole world for, for as long as we can remember. Uh, Samsung, Apple, Google, they have their R&D centers here and in, in uh, Bangalore and other cities in India. So uh, it, it could spark a, a very strong chain reaction because you have all the developers here. Um, plus, if it's supported by the government, which is the case, as we've seen so far, the potential is, is, is definitely great in India. So there's, there's a clear distinction between blockchain innovation and the allowance of cryptocurrency as a method of payment. So I personally think what's going to happen here is that they'll push blockchain projects first and then they'll start looking into how to regulate cryptocurrencies because government is probably the biggest use case for blockchains as it stands today when it comes to tracking ownership, etc., uh, digital identity. Um, the, the ID system in India is one of the world's strongest. So getting that onto a blockchain wouldn't be that big of, a, of, a, of an integration, but you would gain definitely a lot out of it. So yeah, to, to answer your question directly, the energy has been great so far. And we're excited to go to uh, Goa to see the other portion of the conference. We were coming here m mostly to speak to Nucleus Vision. We've known Abby for quite a while. Uh, the IoT solution that they provide is very interesting for us because we do a lot of trade finance. We basically tokenize trade finance instruments for commodity exchanges. So this commodity exchange, we basically know that there's X amount of gold or X amount of steel at this specific commodity or warehouse, and you create a smart contract that allows an Islamic bank to facilitate that loan. The input of how much inventory there is of each commodity is still done manually. So with Nucleus Vision's technology that's going to be built on 11, which was also announced this uh, conference, we'd also like to do a, a system where 
The inventory tracking is done through IoT devices. That information is fed onto the blockchain and then a smart contract would allow for an end-to-end automated process. So uh, there's definitely a very good uh, amount of speakers I have, or good quality of speakers actually, not the amount. Uh, I'm sharing a panel today with the guys at Kasha, which I think have done an, an insanely good job. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an honor being here. Conferences are good, but they're not the all-in-all -all solution. Because if people don't leave here excited, they won't go back home and, and try to get into this. I mean, yesterday in the Binance speech, there was a very interesting categorization of how you could participate in the crypto economy. You could just stay relevant and read up, read up about it. You could invest because this is one of the only financial instruments or asset classes that you could invest by just going online and, and buying with minimal uh, barriers to entry, let's say. Or you could actually get into working into the industry, which I believe is, is, is the best way forward. Look at any of the early adopters of the internet. I mean, those comparisons are drawn way too often, but it's, it goes well to remember that early adopters, especially the ones that, that not only invest, but the ones that work in it, they see all the problems at an early stage. So once blockchain technology is ready for uh, industrial-wide adoption, then they'll, they'll have definitely have the upper hand. I personally think that, first of all, digital records of ownership will definitely be, be moved on-chain. That's for several reasons. Transparency, fighting corruption, especially in countries where uh, land registries have been the subject of, of uh, scandal. So I think the public sector is one of the clearest use cases today. Then you have, look, there's, there's something called technology uh, infrastructure inversion. It's, to, to give an analogy to kind of uh, make you understand it better, if you got cars to run on what horses used to, the roads that horses used to uh, ride on, you'd think that cars are inefficient. Where in reality, the road was not built for the car. So today you have a financial ecosystem that's insanely convoluted, and then you're trying to bring this new technology and place it over on top of it, uh, it doesn't work. So once the infrastructure inversion happens, then you won't have systems like SWIFT or Euroclear or all these other uh, settlement and clearing houses that effectively uh, collect data or aggregate data and then process it in a, in a slow and expensive manner uh, because of dependency on, on legacy systems. So until that happens, uh, I think the financial sector will be the stickiest in terms of sticky, uh, trying to continue working with existing systems. Uh, but we'll slowly see banking change. I mean, if you're familiar with Revolut or Monzo or these neo banks, these are slowly but surely killing off commercial banking and retail banking at financial institutions. So I think the banking as we know it will, will change. Um, that's not only primarily driven by blockchain. Blockchain is an enabler. It's not the panacea. It's not the all-in-all -all solution. Um, but as the trends of like dematerialization, you don't need to have branches and pay employees salaries and health insurance and electricity and water. That, that is the reason why banks charge high transfer fees. Uh, because they have to pay off all that cost. So it won't be in a day like, oof, everything is, is on blockchain today, because reality is it, it, you have to remember that blockchains are still slow and expensive. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting technology, but again, comparing with the internet, when a picture used to take five minutes to send or a, a, a song used to take two hours to download on... Uh, uh, yeah, exactly, on the internet, that wasn't convenient. But you could see how this would become a daily part of your life. Very similar to what's happening in the blockchain industry today. The greatest learning from IBC. The, I was very impressed by the quality of participants in the hackathon. Hackathons are usually a hit or miss. And I think the guys at IBC definitely hit it. Uh, very good amount of participation. Uh, everyone is like the, the way that they structured it, each group. Um, have a specific time to, to solve it and there's winners of every day. It's not like one winner for the whole event. Uh, yeah, so I think the learning point was that, it wasn't a learning point, it was kind of reconfirmation that, all right, developers in India are very strong.